Frazier, and I'm joined by my colleague, Rob Labetti. Hey, we're going to be covering sports from all aspects, from football to wrestling to fantasy football and everything in between. Have a seat and join us. And enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our view from the sports, our view from the Cap Sports Podcast. I'm Rob LeBenny with my partner in crime, Ronnie Frazier. Ronnie, how's everything going today, bud? Hey, doing good, buddy. Staying warm. 36 yeah. degrees in Charleston. Oh geez, it's 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 pretty cold here too. Um, speaking of cold, uh, Florida State this weekend got left out in the cold. Uh, didn't crack that top four of the uh, college football playoff, and uh, boy, it's just a tough spot for well everybody to be in Florida State to be in the committee to be in. But uh, what are your early thoughts on that so far, Ron? I can't. I really can't blame. Them. I kind of see it both ways. I'll, I hate to see any undefeated team left out of a, a bowl game, you know, but uh, I think they made the right decision uh, with the quarterback probably not being there. So I, I agree with you. I, I do think they made the right decision. Um, even with him in the lineup, I, I've been thinking about this all week. They still would have had a tough decision to make. I mean, you got, you got Alabama playing Georgia, who Georgia comes in with 29 straight wins undefeated. According to the committee going into that game, they were the number one team in the country. They were – all they had to do was win, and they were going to be the one seed no matter what. But Alabama goes in, plays a good game, beats them. Um, and then don't count Alabama out. Alabama's a good football team too. Their only loss, of course, to the Texas Longhorns, who go out and just handle their business in the, in the uh, Big 12 championship game. And – Texas went into Alabama and won that game earlier in the season. So those those two teams right there are right in the mix of it. And then, of course, you got Michigan, who spent some time at number one, according to the committee. They go in and shut out Iowa, which was no surprise. The only surprise was I, I didn't know Iowa wasn't going to bring their offense with them. I, I didn't realize that they were going to punt on first down all night and let Michigan play. So, um Right. Or because my lock of the week last week was Michigan or was uh, Iowa plus the 22 and a half. And I was pretty close to right, except Iowa didn't do their part on offense. So, um, but back to Florida State, they, I, I still don't know, Ron. And if, 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 if Travis doesn't get hurt, I still not 100% sure that Florida State gets into the top four with him there just by what went down with those with those championship games. They still would have had a tough decision to make one way or another. Now, it's convenient for the committee that Travis did go down because they can use that as an excuse. Even with Travis, I'm not sure that they're favored in any of those football games against Alabama, Michigan, Texas, whatever. I mean, Alabama, for crying out loud, they're they're only a point and a half uh, underdog to Michigan. And there's a lot of people that think Alabama's going to beat Michigan, and it's not going to surprise me one bit if they don't, or if they do beat Michigan. I really – Michigan, other than Ohio State and maybe Penn State, really haven't played anybody this year, to be honest with you. Right. So they're they're untested. And I don't think you can ever leave an SEC champion out of the mix. They week in and week out, they're playing NFL talent every week, and so have we. Opinion, have we? Have we ever seen a team go from like eighth ranked to the top four like that? Have we? Ever, I mean, I don't. I don't recall in recent that, history. Not that. Not that I can recall. Um, it's. It is unprecedented, but it's been – I mean, there's been we, – we talked about this a couple podcasts ago about that top four. And if you recall, I, I, I mentioned the Alabama-Texas thing when, when, when we got into yeah. that. I said, if you got to take one, if Alabama gets in, how do you let Texas out? Because if Alabama gets in, Texas beat Alabama in Alabama. Right. So you can't take one without the other. And – God bless myself for being right once in my life. I, I was I was right on it because that's exactly what the committee did. And, hey, it's gonna uh, make, 
It's going to make for some interesting games. Um, I like the matchups too, right off the get go. I do like the matchups. You're going to, I think you're going to have a pretty close, low scoring game against uh, with Michigan and Alabama uh, for people that like defense. And then I think uh, Texas Washington has, has the makings of a shootout, um, high scoring affair. And then you're going to have two different styles going against each other in the national championship game, one way or another. So, yeah, they, they are interesting matchups. Um, I like, I think the committee did a good job matching everybody up and, uh, um, it's yeah, it's going to be super fun to watch. Uh, Cotton Bowl, Ohio State, and Mizzou, Mizzou. That kind of, I was surprised by that a little bit. Yeah, I was. There was a couple of those matchups that uh, that, that surprised me. Um, I, I mean, I, I you got to give Ohio State the not the not in that. I think just talent wise, they're they're probably a little bit more loaded up than Missouri is. Um, Still could be an entertaining game. I mean, Missouri fought their way through an SEC schedule, ended up ninth, I believe they were in the country. So, um, should be an interesting matchup there, no doubt. Yeah, you know, uh, Penn State could make history if they win in the Peach Bowl against uh, Ole Miss. This is they'll be the first school in college football history to record a win in each of the games that make up the New Year's Six. No the, kidding. I, I didn't Royal, read that this week. Yeah, um, the Rose Bowl, the Orange Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl, they've all won. Nice. They've nice. never had a chance to uh, go to the Peach, so if they win it, that's a little bit of history. They do the that's, first team. That, that's that's pretty interesting. That's uh, that's big, and I, and I I I give them I give them all the chance in the world to win that football game. Uh, I. Ole Miss is a good football team. They're they're pretty decent on offense. Uh, they have a tendency to give up some points. Um, I've got a chance to watch them a few times this year, and um, but I think Penn State's defense can play well enough to keep them in check, and I, I, I think we can score some points to win that football game. So I, I give Penn State a, a little bit of a nod in that, and I I think I saw the other day that Penn State is a four and a half point favorite in that game. So yeah. Uh, I think Penn State will do okay there. I really do. That defense, regardless of what they say about the offense, that defense is a real deal. They are tough. Right. You know, they make a big deal about these bowl games, Rob. And, but you know what? The good draftable players, the seniors that are going to be entering the draft, or the juniors that are going to be entering the draft, they sit out of the bowl games anyhow. It's, yeah. So you don't you don't always see in your best players in these bowl games. Yep, and, and we we talked a little bit about this too before the show, and and I'm I'm kind of on both sides of the fence on this one. I I, I get where the players coming from. Um, the these higher end talented elite players who are going to be in the draft in a few months here, uh, coming up in April, and um, taking a chance of getting hurt and. Uh, what basically comes down to an exhibition game. I mean, yeah, it, it rewards the the team for a season and they get to make a trip and play an extra football game and in normally a warm climate. And it's, it, it's fun for everybody and it's made for TV and all that good stuff. And uh, networks get to make a little extra money on advertising and it's, it's just all fun for everybody. But these guys are from their point of view, they're, they're looking to get paid here in a few months and, to go out and blow a knee or whatever is, is a big chance of their, their, their draft stock plummeting. So you can see their point of view. Now, the, the other side of it for me is you've, you've spent four years with this school. Most of them have had their school paid for. They've, uh, they have teammates that they've played four years with, or sometimes even more nowadays. They got five years, whatever. And then just to kind of walk away from your team and say, hey, I got bigger and better things. You guys go take care of business. That's a part of it I don't like. Um, so as, as a fan, I know a couple of years ago when Pickett didn't play against Michigan State in the uh, their bowl game after Pitt won the ACC championship and all that, I, I was a little uh, – I don't want to say upset, but I mean, we, we could have went and beat Michigan state and had one of our best top 10 finishes in a long time. And instead we went with uh, 
a backup and then he got hurt and we had a third string guy playing and we ended up getting beat by Michigan State that was a little uh, that was a little disappointing so I can I can see from a fan standpoint and a school standpoint both sides of it so. I do too I do too I definitely see both sides I mean the one side the loyalty as you're speaking of to your school and then on the other hand on a personal note it could cost you millions mega millions if you're not taken in the first round or something I you know you're, they're looking for the rest of their life the school's kind of looking for that one year maybe two yeah. year you yeah. know success but yeah I definitely see it both ways hey Speaking of Ohio State, quarterback Kyle McCord entered the transfer portal. I mean, is he looking for a major payday for or an NIL deal? Or did you see I, that? I, yeah, I did see that. I also saw here. I'm going to throw a number at you. <laughs> Over 1,100 um, football players entered the the uh, transfer portal since it opened at the end of the season there 1100 players i mean it's it's crazy this this mentality where if i'm not if i can't play i'm leaving and all that it's it's getting bad and and, and you know it's going to get to the point where if you're a college coach you don't even have to recruit anymore i mean you just got to sit back and wait for the portal to open and i'm going to build a team off the portal Right. I mean, let let somebody else go knock on doors and talk to these guys. I'll just wait and get these blue chippers the the year after they don't start their freshman year. I mean, right. boy, I I don't know, what? man. I they they're gonna have a problem. Yeah, ever since they started the NIL, and, and that's another thing. I'm on both sides of the fence with that. I mean, I think players should be able to make money on their name, image, and likeness. They should be able to afford a pizza on a Saturday night if they want. You know, a lot of these college students have struggled for years, and they're making money off them. And I get it. They're getting an education in this and that. But they're definitely sometimes bringing in a lot more money. You want to explain to our audience what the name, image, and likeness is? I think some people don't understand how that works. Well, basically, these, these guys that... Uh they can they can collect money from advertising shirt sales uh advertising um like you can get on your local car store and do a commercial for them and, and get paid for it where is a few years ago uh, a student athlete basically got his scholarship and that was it anything he got extra was it was a violation boosters couldn't buy him stuff uh the school couldn't Go, I'll go above and beyond. Hell, if a if a coach and took him out for a hamburger, it was a violation. That, that's just right. something they couldn't do. And uh, in a way, it was something that had to be done. I mean, these schools are making millions off of these kids, um, and they were they've been making millions forever between television contracts and and image and likeness sales. I mean, uh, you can go over to State College and walk into one of the bookstores, and you'd have jerseys hanging all over the place and there's no names on them but you know who they were and mm -hmm. people just buying them right and left but the, the, those guys that represented those numbers never got a dime for it and they're they were the ones driving the sales so to me this this was something that had to be done i, I think that these guys deserve a piece of the pie but to me they really have no tie to the school now. There, there's no reason for them um, to stay where they're at when the grass is green or somewhere else. Now, did down the road do they implement contracts where with would you bring a kid in his freshman year? He has to agree. Okay, you're going to get this amount of money, and. I, well, I mean, you'd have to take that one step further. Does does the school get paid the NLI, NIL money to put into a fund and then they sign their players accordingly and they get paid X amount of money out of this, depending on what they agree on when they go to the school and they come out of here with a contract and that way that kid's tied to the school. Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot to discuss. I mean, this isn't a perfect system, Ron. And I, I mean, I... 
I think about this and it, it's killing wrestling. It's, it's, it's eventually going to kill college football. Now those are, those are two basketball has been like, I mean, it hasn't been like this for years, but basketball is a whole different thing when you got kids growing up playing together and AAU and all that kind of shit. They, they're bringing their friends to the same school and building championship teams, regardless of where the hell they're doing. So, uh, it's boy, college, college sports has got a lot to work out here. They really do. Well, they're, they're actually becoming employees. I mean, in a way, they are becoming employees. Yes. So that, yes. that compl- once that goes, you know, that complicates things right there. As soon as they're yeah. an employee, then you got all these laws, employee, employer laws all of a sudden, you know? Yeah. Well, but for years, I mean, it was just the opposite. They were – choose my words here, careful. They were basically just labor that wasn't getting paid. I mean, they were they were raising a lot of money for these schools and not getting anything back for it other than, I mean, yeah, they were getting an education and stuff, which is fine, but that education wasn't anywhere close to the amount of what these schools were getting from ESPN, ABC, NBC, Fox. Yep. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, those schools were raking in a lot, a lot of cash. And these kids weren't, uh, they weren't uh, getting a piece of it. So, yeah, I think it's going to take a long time to tweak this system. I think there's, everything's going to keep popping up. There's going to be different speed bumps along the way with this whole thing. You know, it's ironic, Rob, is like, it was like two weeks ago. I seen the Ohio State coach, head coach, do an interview. And he made a comment that it's going to take $2 million dollars to keep us a, a starting or get a good starting quarterback eventually. Now this was before Kyle McCord entered the transfer, but that coach made that he made that. I, and I can't remember where I seen it, but he made that comment that it's going to take a $2 million bag to a starting quarterback. Yeah. And that doesn't surprise me a bit. Um, I mean, I, I I, I don't know this off the top of my head, but I, I've seen some of what uh, these top-notch quarterbacks are making, like uh, Caleb Williams and guys like that, and they're they're making above two million dollars with these this NIL money. I think they're in a three to four million dollar range, and that's that's crazy money for a twenty-two year old, twenty-one year old kid in college. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean it's but, just insane, but it's it's. it's the world we live in a funny thing on that they were i i seen another clip where uh deon sanders's son they were both in the in this booth and they were talking and somebody was interviewing or i think it was just like regular conversation but it was on tape oh i and think they, they were talking weren't they talking to eli and peyton on their little monday night show or something like that and he said about entering the, the son said he wanted to enter the draft and Dion says, you ain't going nowhere. You'll make, <laughs> you make more money. You'll make more money your senior year of college than you will your first year of NFL. Yeah. Isn't that insane? That's yeah. Is yeah, that, was well, that, he's a, that? Yeah. He was another one. I think that was in that four to $5 million range as far as what he was making in NL NIL money right now. I, and he's, I mean, he's a good quarterback, but he's at Colorado for crying out loud. They were four and eight, five and seven, and he's making that kind of money as a quarterback there. Come on, jeez. Oh man. Hey, well, they they say the Ohio State quarterback he could either go to Maryland. I don't know how Maryland comes up with this kind of money, or North Carolina. Them the two that are popping up. I, he could go right back to Ohio State. Yeah. That's that doesn't make. I don't know why you would leave Ohio State to go to Maryland or North Carolina. To be honest with you, um, yeah, that I, that's weird. That's uh, yeah. You're getting way just, more at Ohio State than he is at those two places. So that's weird. So what? What else do you see in college happening? None. I, I think. Uh, I, I think there's an above average chance that Alabama's going to beat Michigan. And uh, I'm going to go with Washington over uh, over Texas. So I, I 
My my call right now is uh, I'm going to take Alabama against Washington in the national championship game. That's that's my call. Um, anybody hasn't had a chance to watch this Penix kid from Washington play? He's fun to watch. He's a he's a hell of a thrower of the football, and uh, I think Alabama is just hitting their stride right now. Um, this quarterback of theirs, Milrow, he is. He is one big, strong, tough quarterback. I mean, he is he he's a Tebow type with I think maybe even a little bit more athleticism. He is uh he's fun to watch. And I'm not an Alabama guy by any stretch of the imagination, but um I've got a chance to watch quite a few of their games this year and I, I really like watching this Milro kid play quarterback. So don't be surprised if they knock Michigan off. And uh, I think uh, I think Penix is going to have a good game against Texas, and I think that's going to be your national title game coming up. So right. Uh, one one thing in uh, college I want to touch on um, Heisman favorites. My Heisman favorite right now I think is quarterback Jaden Daniels of LSU. I don't yeah. know what your thoughts are. I, I do, uh, and there, there's a team right there, LSU, if they would have had, boy, just a little bit of defense to put behind this kid, you might be talking about LSU and as maybe the number one team in the country. That offense was explosive with Daniels, and if you look at his numbers compared to Burrow when he won it, um, his numbers are better than Burrow's. So, yeah, I'm with you there that he's – He's right up there in that 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 mix, and I, I'm with you. If if I was giving it away, I think Jay Daniels is your guy. He is he's an exciting player. Um, I really he's a guy that uh, I think could definitely win that. And it would have been fun to watch LSU this year if they could have just held some teams under 30 points because there was a lot of games where they couldn't hold a team under 30 points and they lost. Right. And uh, they were they were scoring 40 and losing 42-40. So um, it, it was kind of uh, wrong place, wrong time, not having a not having a defense behind you. So, but that yeah, we would be talking about LSU. I definitely like Jaden Daniels, and I think he will make a great quarterback uh, in yeah. the NFL. I mean, he's got yeah. all the tools. The only thing that scares me a little bit about him is as we touched on this a couple weeks ago, size wise. It's not that he's I don't think he's a super short guy, but he's not real thick. He's a he he's a little bit thinner. Um but I think with his athleticism he he's he's probably gonna excel at the next level, there's no doubt. But he he needs to put on a little bit of weight in my opinion. Not a lot, but a little bit. Right. Well hey since we're talking about standouts, let's kind of like transition to the NFL a little bit. Uh, last last week we were talking about MVP favorites, and you mentioned Brock Purdy. He is now the favorite, Rob. You must have looked in your crystal ball because now he is the favorite, plus 300, to be the MVP of the NFL. Listen, Ron, I'm glad you brought up Ron, uh, Brock Purdy because I've been, I've been wanting to talk about Brock Purdy all morning long. So... Here, here it goes. Because all I've been hearing all week long is, well, if Brock Purdy didn't have this guy or Brock Purdy didn't have that guy or he didn't have this talent around him, he wouldn't be doing the things he's doing. Well, hold on to your hats, fellas, because I'm about to blow your mind. If Terry Bradshaw didn't have the people around him, he never would have done what he did because Terry Bradshaw wasn't that great of a quarterback. There you go. Joe Montana. Joe Montana, you want to talk about a dude right place, right time? Joe Montana reaped the benefits of being around one of the greatest assembled teams in the history of the NFL. You're right. Brock Purdy, same deal. Reaping the benefits of playing on a great football team, and he is making the throws, and he is winning football games. He's lost four games as a starting quarterback. He went into Philadelphia last week and took down what everybody in the NFL thought was the best team in the league, and not only took them down, but beat the piss out of them, Ron. Destroyed them, man. Pounded them. 42 <laughs> points you put up at their house. And all I've heard all week is, now well, Brock Purdy, he's no MVP because of this and that. Well, let me tell you something. If Brock Purdy goes on, 
gets the one seed, takes his team to the Super Bowl and wins it. Guess who the MVP of the NFL is? Brock Purdy. Right. Because this dude is getting it done. And I don't care if he was the last pick of the draft or whatever he was. He is – he's a player, and I'm rooting for this dude right and left. And I've been on the – you can go back to every podcast we've had. I've been on the San Francisco bandwagon all year. This is the yeah. best team in the NFL right now, by far. They are going to oh, yeah. walk to the NFC, and they are the, – God bless whoever gets out of the AFC because I'm thoroughly convinced nobody wants to win in the AFC right now. Whether they're, <laughs> all, whether they're all that good that they can just pound the hell out of each other is one thing. But there's nobody stepping up, in my opinion, in the AFC. And you can take your Miami Dolphins and cram them because until they beat somebody worth a crap, I don't care how many points they're putting up. They're yeah. we're gonna find out in a couple of weeks when they play Baltimore. If they go in and they blow Baltimore out, all right, I'll start coming around. But to me, there's that AFC is wide open from one through ten. Anybody can win that, but You're the correct. NFC mail the NFC trophy to San Francisco right now and let them get rested up for the Super Bowl. That's what I think. I could I could almost guarantee you the MVP. I agree. I and I I think uh, the MVP if it is isn't Purdy, it's still coming out of the NFC. AFC had all them great quarterbacks in the beginning of the season, but you know it's either going to be Purdy. Hertz or Prescott, depending on the, the play. Yep. From here and on I, out. I still, That's how I, I feel still, about it. I still think you can kind of throw uh um CMC in that mix too. Um I think I, he's he's the about the only non quarterback other than uh boy, I won't even bring his name up, but you can bring up Tariq Hill too. I mean, if he gets to two thousand yards and leads the league in touchdowns there's another guy you have to throw into the mix. I mean, nobody's ever done that. I mean, he's he a freak. Up, he is a freak. He is a freak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, he, nope. he is definitely torching top notch cornerbacks and safeties. And so he's another guy. If he gets to those kind of lofty numbers, you're going to have to put him in the mix also. All right. I'm going to shade off this a little bit. I'm going to give you my choice so far. For coach of the year, and I, I definitely think it's DeMarco Ryans of the Houston, Texas Texans. What he's done there, absolutely amazing. I know they've got four losses, I believe, right? Four or five? No, four. They, got, uh, they got five. They're, I think they're seven and five. Yeah, they are okay. seven and five. They're the, seven they're the eight and five. spot. Yep. Same deal, though. If, if, if they can make a run, get in the playoffs, and do something. He's taken this team that was an absolute zero goose egg team and created something with them. And look out for them in the future. Holy goodness, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you there. I, I think that that's a no-brainer coach of the year right there is D'Amico Ryans. Yeah, I, I definitely think he's the guy. And, uh, yeah, it's, he's done just a great job down in Houston, no doubt about it. Yeah. And a couple teams this week can clinch the playoff berth. Um San Francisco, Philadelphia, and Dallas. They yeah. can actually, they can all clinch playoff. Yeah, things uh, that uh, well Sunday night is uh, is another monster NFC game. Is uh, Philadelphia's got to make the trip down to Texas and take on the Cowboys uh, at eight fifteen. Um, Hurts being just a little bit banged up. I think he hasn't been. I think he, I don't think he's been one hundred percent right all year. He, Boy, I, I don't like I don't like Philadelphia going into Dallas Sunday night. I got a feeling that uh, I got a feeling Dallas is going to take it to them. Uh, I hope I'm wrong because, of course, I'd much rather see Philadelphia win than Dallas. But uh, I just got a feeling that Philadelphia is on a little bit of a schneid right now, and uh, I think they're I think Dallas at home is just uh, is just trouble for them. I really do. I do I mean, too. Dallas should have beat them in Philadelphia a few weeks ago. So, um, well, let's let's touch briefly on the Steeler game last week. Um, I want to tell you what I wasn't able to watch it live, Rob, and but I was watching my phone. I was going to have to watch it on replay. 
and I'm watching my phone and then I'm watching no scores third quarter. And then I'm thinking what's going on. They had that delay, you know, I, so I wasn't able to watch it until I had to watch it on replay. And I was like, I don't even want to watch this game, <laughs> but I did. I ended up watching it, but how sad, Rob, what is going on? It's, it, it was so sad. You go from, you go from having the ball at the one yard line, looking to score a touchdown, you get stopped on. I, I, I don't even understand why. Why? Why are we so uncreative on like fourth and ones and everything else? We line up and just here you go, fellas. We're going right up the middle on you. We get stopped. So we, we go from being able to score a touchdown and take uh, a lead to letting Arizona go ninety nine yards, score a touchdown, and then from that point, you were never in that football game. The only bright spot for the Pittsburgh Steelers in that football game was that we continued to run the ball well with Warren and Harris. But by the time they got down two or three touchdowns, you might as well shove the running game up your you-know-what. because, And then Pickett on the fourth and one play gets hurt. He gets his ankle rolled up on, and he's out. And now you got Trubisky in, which, you know, you can sit and piss and moan about Trubisky all you want. If if we don't get picket in the draft, you know who your starter is? Mitch Trubisky. So Mitch Trubisky would have been our starter if it wouldn't have been for Pickett anyhow. Or if Pickett would have came in out of the draft and was a flop, Trubisky would have been your starter. To me, there's not that big of a downside from going from Pickett to Trubisky. No, not I at mean, all. How, how can we do any worse? Pickett's only thrown two touchdown passes in his, what, last eight games? If Trubisky throws one, he's done half as good. <laughs> so, I, Pickett, I mean, how, how worse can we get? Pickett has only thrown 13 touchdowns in 22 games. Yeah. That's pathetic. Yeah. That's pathetic. It is. And it's and not he's all Pickett. Pickett. And it's wrong. We're it's always, not all Pickett. No. No. I mean, the line's horrific. The, the line's still horrific. You know, he's going to be out two to two to four weeks. But here's another thing. We were always talking about the predictability of Canada. Kenny Pickett's a little predictable. Have you ever seen him? He, he will not step up in the, in the pocket. And there's times he could have. He continues to roll out to the left. Always the left. You ever see him roll out to the right? I might have seen him roll out one time to the right one time. All right. Predictability. We might have made a mistake there. We might have made a mistake. We we very well could have. Uh, I think it's still, I think it's still up in the air. I mean, it's trending that way. It certainly is trending that this maybe this isn't the guy. Um, but for the time being, I mean, we're we're still in a playoff hunt. I I get. I'm going to go back to the Arizona game for a second because what drives me nuts the most. Is you you got you got a team that comes that's coming in at uh, seven and four at that point, and they got a two and ten team at home. They can separate themselves from the other two wild card teams. Keep pace with Baltimore only a game back. This game is everything to you. And they came out and played the most uninspired football that I have ever seen in my life by a team that should be fighting their asses off for a playoff spot. And one, yeah, this is the player's fault because their performance was horrendous from, from top to bottom. That secondary, even with Minka back, they got torched by a rookie tight end. Not that he's not a good tight end because it is. I mean, they got rid of Zach Hurts to keep this guy, and it shows why. He had a great oh, yeah. game. Right. Good. Yeah, he did a great job against Pittsburgh. But our secondary blew – Watt didn't have a good game. Hightower didn't have a good game. We couldn't stop James Conner. And there were the, the grade on this game from top to, bother, to top to bottom, other than the running backs and the running game, was flat out Fs. Uninspired football. And to me, not only is that a player problem, but that's starting with, uh, with the coaches. These, uh, I swear to God that they, they just show up. There's no game plan. 
they just show up and they, they, it's like they're winging it. It's, it's like backyard football. Yeah, it, it's like they roll up 10, 10, 15 minutes before the game starts and they throw the equipment bag on the ground and say, all right, you're playing here, you're playing there, let's go. Break. And they come out of the huddle and ready to play football because they just – for a team that's fighting for a playoff spot, can't take it. Yeah, it's bad, and I can't take it. That's still our offense. They're about as effective as a car with no tires, and they just not going nowhere, man. Just not going nowhere. It's frustrating. I mean, it's anemic. It, like oh. you said, it, it's anemic. That that, that there, it's horrible. But you know, and this, you know, this when was the last chance? What was the last chance you think Steelers had a team capable of making the Super Bowl? 2018, they didn't do any. They didn't do it, but maybe 2018 they had, and then before that it was 2008. Yeah, it's it, there. There hasn't been, boy, off the top of my head, Ron. I I can't remember the last time I went into a season thinking that, yeah, this team's got a legitimate shot. Uh, it's probably, it's probably been five or six years because I, I mean I'm about as realistic as a dude you're gonna find, and when it comes to sports and. Um, I mean, this year I was, I mean, I'm still hopeful that we're going to be a playoff team and in the NFL, I guess you could say that that's about all you can really hope for because we've seen in the past that not always the best team gets to the Super Bowl. You just need to get in the playoffs and get hot. And I guess that's always my hope is that Steelers get to the playoffs and you string a few games together and all of a sudden you're looking at a Super Bowl bid. Um, but I mean, we're right now. I, I highly doubt you're going to see Pickett at least the rest of the regular season. Um, I, I just don't see him back in two weeks from a high ankle sprain and having surgery. I mean, my my best yeah. case scenario would hopefully he be back for the Baltimore game if that game even means anything by then. And um, it may not. But, yeah, but it, it, tonight, like. You you can tonight you can have a three nothing football game. You got New England who might have a worse offense than us. Yeah, and they have a great defense. I mean, they've given up they've given up less than ten points, ten points or less in their last three games, and have lost all three of them. So and they're always on the field. They got to be tired. So they're, yeah, they, they are. They're going to be napping on the bus on the way to the stadium. They're so tired. And wow. so yeah, who knows what's going to happen tonight. I, I have no – I'm going into this game with whatever happens, happens, because they – I don't want to say I lost all faith in them last week when they could have went for a kill shot and they just let it slip through their fingers. They got another home game tonight against a, a team with two freaking wins who who can't score points worse than they, – they play offense worse than Pittsburgh does. <laughs> but I guarantee you, somehow tonight, New England's going to find a way to play offense, and we're probably going to get beat 17-14. If we can score 14 points, that is. It might be it might be 17-9. We might kick three field goals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what, Rob? I'm going to throw this some of this stuff at you, and I'm going to, you know, I've got to have my little rant. And I think yeah. it's a little bit, it's more than, you well, know, we blame Canada for stuff. You know, we can blame Pickett for stuff. The facts are there that I, I mean, I truly believe we still need to draft a quarterback in the top three rounds next year. I, I, I do that. We need a cornerback. We, I think every year you have to add offensive linemen so they can have chemistry throughout the years. But, you know, maybe the problem is Art Rooney. He inherited a great dynasty, and I don't think he's a happy-go-lucky guy. I don't think he has a clue what it takes to maintain a dynasty. And, and I, and we can go back, you know, Noll, Chuck Noll, to me, one of the best, definitely one of the best coaches Steelers ever had, but you know, let's be real. He should have been let go in the eighties because he did not adjust to the times, to the, to the, the advancement of the game. They did not do nothing. Tomlin by no, he is not Noll's equal. But uh, he, it seems like he has more job security than Chuck Noll ever had. But I'm just, I'm just going over here. Can we trade? Can you trade a coach for a first-round pick? And if somebody thinks he's that great, 
maybe two first round picks. I think Tomlin needs to be on the hot seat, man. You know, and I'm going to throw another fact out here. How many years has Tomlin been on there? How many, how many years is it? It's over 15, 15 plus 17, maybe like six, 15, 16 years. I believe I think I want to say Kyra was done in 08, maybe. Okay. Uh, so Tomlin, yeah, you're right. Because of the Arizona game, the Arizona Super Bowl. You're right. Um, Tom, and here's another one. And one of Tomlin's biggest indictments is his lack of a coaching tree. Never once has he had a member of his staff become a head coach. In all those years, you've never produced a head coach out of your thing. Now, where Andy Reid has had five, Shanahan has had four, McVay has had four. There's nothing special going on in Pittsburgh. Once you start digging, you start going down these rabbit holes and start finding this stuff. It's crazy. I, and I think maybe Tomlin wants to maintain his comfort zone. But, the, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that, and I want your thoughts on that. Well, let's let's talk about Tomlin. I, well, let's talk about Rooney, okay? I, I think the Roonies are sometimes loyal to a fault with guys. Um, I, I can honestly tell you if I was the owner of the Steelers um, 10 weeks ago, I would have I would have been having serious discussions about Matt Canada with my uh, with my head coach. We found out later when Matt Co when when Canada did get fired, it was Tomlin's decision. It had nothing to do with the Rooneys. So they say. I'm just going by what I've read. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm the owner of that team, I'm having discussions about, hey, listen, fellas, where's my offense? This is this is my team. Where's my offense? And if this guy ain't getting it done, I want a change made. Now, Tomlin, who I, I, I'm going to say that I do think deep down Tomlin, in the sense of a coach, is a good coach. I think he's a terrible game manager. I've, I've been saying this for years. His, yep. his in-game decisions are freaking horrible. Um, he's made over the years. I wish I could put together a list and a video clip of some of the dumb decisions he's made or didn't make, for that matter, um, in big football games. I, I think he's a player's coach. I think his players love playing for him. Um, I don't think he's a big disciplinarian. I don't think that there's a lot of a lot of people being held accountable in the locker room for what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I, I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on that wouldn't happen if Cowher was there. Um, uh, so I, I think there's some good with Tomlin. But I also think that there's some bad with Tomlin. And I, I do think he deep down in the sense of a coach is a good coach. I think he I think he knows his stuff. Um, I think he has every intention on doing the right thing in Pittsburgh. But there's times where maybe he's not head coach material. Maybe he's maybe he's a defensive coordinator type guy. Maybe he's an assistant head coach. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe that that sort of thing, but there's times where I just don't think his teams are prepared to play big football games. There's times where I don't think they're prepared to play shitty football games like they did last Sunday. Um, so from Rooney's the Rooney standpoint, I think sometimes that they're I, I, they're just too loyal to to their to their employees. This is a league where you only have short windows to do certain things, and. I think you need to take advantage of those windows when they appear. And sometimes I think that maybe Tomlin's had some cracks at having better football teams and the Roonies have let those windows close and not done anything about it. So there's, that's what I think about the, the Tomlin thing. Um, I, I do think that it is getting a little bit ridiculous that, yeah, he's never had a losing record, but he's never done anything with those winning records either. Um, we haven't won a playoff game in a long time. We haven't been deep into the playoffs. Yeah, Coward didn't go to a lot of Super Bowls, but, boy, he went to a lot of AFC championship games. I mean, there was a ton. So we would, we would go deep into those – we would go deep into those playoff runs. We haven't made one of those deep runs in a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, I I think I said it before in a, in a future podcast. I think what, in eleven years we've only won three playoff games. Yeah, and that's, that's 
you know, meteorocracy. Who, who wants who wants meteorocracy? I'd rather see a team win a Super Bowl every five years than make the AFC five years in a row. We can't do it. Yeah. Well, it's it's tough to be. The league's not designed for teams that have five, six years of straight winning Super Bowls and stuff. I mean, this isn't. It's not the way the the schedules are set up. It's not the way the draft's set up. It's not. This isn't the way the NFL is supposed to be. You're not supposed to go out and win three, four Super Bowls in a row. That's not the way it is. I mean, you. This is this is why I say that if if you come into the season hoping your team makes the playoffs and they can get there, you had a pretty successful season and you should be happy with what you got. Now, as Steeler fans, are we a little bit spoiled? You're goddamn right, we are. Because since 1970, nobody's won more football games than the Steelers. I, I think the Patriots are getting close, but we we've been spoiled. We we yeah. made the playoffs most of the time. We've won a lot of football games. We won six Super Bowls. So we come out every season and we expect to win a Super Bowl. That's that's the standard in Pittsburgh. And if we stub our toe or we get in trouble, now it's all of a sudden, holy shit, what's going on in Pittsburgh? And yeah. That drives me nuts to a certain point because everything's cyclical in sports. You're going to have your good. You're going to have bad. you got to go through these things to get to the, the top of the mountain. And that's why I, I hate being too down on a team. I hate being too up on a team because um, I understand how sports works, and especially the NFL. This is how this happens. You're not going to win four Super Bowls in a row. Steeler fans come to expect a Super Bowl every year. And that's fine and everything, but you can't live like that. It's and I think the Steelers need to they need to start building there. And it starts with I'm going with you on the picket thing. I, I I between Pickett and that offensive line and those wide receivers, man, that there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And I, I'm not saying Pickett's not the guy because he needs a little help. But that offensive line and his wide receivers aren't helping him whatsoever. Right. Hey, now you would you mentioned about him being uh, a good defensive coordinator, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. But you know, you notice most of these teams, they're the successful teams are more offensive minded coaches nowadays. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. Like I'm with you with McVay and Shanahan and those guys. Um, well, and, and all those guys, you talked about coaching trees. You McDaniel, Shanahan, McVeigh. I mean, all these games, all these guys came out of Shanahan's old man's coaching tree when he was in Washington. They were all on the same staff there. I think uh, so. I mean, they they're all from the, the same kind of category where they learned. Uh, and if I remember right, Shanahan was an assistant on Walsh's staff um, a long time no ago. So she, Shanahan came out of the Walsh system, who's the inventor of what we watch every Sunday. The the, the West Coast spread them out, throw the ball, that that sort of thing. So I mean, all these offensive coaches are coming from that that Walsh lineage the whole way up through, and they're they're adding little little nuances to it. And I mean, if you look what oh, I'm just gonna say it again, if you look what Miami's doing, and if you look what uh, San Francisco's doing, and um, the Rams have had some success over the last couple of years, of course. They went to a Super Bowl, and all of a sudden, they're right in the playoff mix again. And so, yeah, I, I, but I, I think when it comes to offense, that maybe you get guys that are a little bit more detail-oriented uh, as opposed to offense or defenses where maybe these guys that are defensive-type guys, maybe the attention to detail is not quite as good as what it is on offense. I don't think you have to be as fine on defense as you do on offense, but yeah, you definitely see a distinct advantage between what, what those types of guys are doing on football teams and what defensive type guys are doing on football teams. I, I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you look at their current success, their current success. And I think there has to be a lot said, you're only as good as your like for a head coach. You're only as good as your other, you know, the people around you, you know. Uh, and if you're not creating future future head coaches, then you might not have the quality of players to actually at the NFL level coach these mm -hmm. players. And uh, I think we're lacking there. I mean, Andy Reid 
has five head coaches that came out from under him. That's amazing. Shanahan, four. McVay, four. You know, maybe maybe Tomlin just likes to maintain that comfort zone like I was talking about. He don't want anybody that can actually maybe test his knowledge or something. I don't sure. know. Well, that, that happens in the business world a lot where you get an insecure dude running a company and he's he doesn't like to relegate authority to people that are better than him because they're he's afraid they're going to take his job and uh, that's what that's what a lot of people would compare this situation to maybe maybe that's what Tom one thinks is you don't want to get better people around you to to show you up or make you look bad to where you're thinking maybe you're not the guy so I mean yeah I mean uh, subconsciously maybe that's what's going on people I mean brilliant people want brilliant people around them and i mean that's just the way it is you don't unless you've got some sort of thing in the back of your head where you don't want to be surrounded by these people to make your life easier and uh, because you're afraid they're going to show you up but uh i mean I, you and i both know I, I know from my standpoint i would rather have people around me that know what they're doing because my life's 10 times easier if i don't have to do everything Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, it, it, a smart man knows what he knows. An intelligent man knows what he doesn't know. And then that's where your great coaches come around. I mean, I don't know. You know, but I, I'm, I'm a little nervous with what we got and what, what happened. How do you look at us going into the draft next year i'm thinking we almost got a clean house on some of these quarterbacks some of these receivers linemen let's let's accumulate some draft picks do a little trading up because we definitely know we need a cornerback as well we didn't talk about that but when fitzpatrick's not back there it's we've seen the void we've seen the void that, that's another thing that we need to address we need to address that i say we get a quarterback in the fourth round maybe third if we can move up, something falls to us and uh, get that receiver you're talking about. Maybe uh, a good receiver. I mean, there are not going to be many running backs in this thing. The quarterbacks ain't going to come until the third, fourth round, the quality yeah. ones. Uh, I think there's going to be some good offensive tackles and a good center that Pittsburgh could grab early, which I would love that. Yeah, but I, I mean – if we could just find one that doesn't roll the ball back to the quarterback three times a game, that would be awesome. Um, I know they're not easy to find because I watched the NFL and I saw, I saw only one center this week roll the ball back to the quarterback three times, and he just happened to be in Pittsburgh this week. So, <laughs> um, the uh, as far as the draft, I, I think first and foremost, the one thing that Pittsburgh needs to do once this season's over is they need to assess – now, here's the thing with Pickett. Pickett's going to have one more year on his rookie deal before the five-year thing hits. So, regardless of what you think of Kenny Pickett, you almost have to think that Pickett is probably getting one more year under center before they make a decision on whether or not he they're going to give him his, his five-year deal as far as keeping him on. Unfortunately, I, I, I pick it, whether it's good or bad. I, hopefully it's good, but I almost can guarantee you that I think Pickett is going to have one more year under center to prove that he's the guy. Now, as far as Trubisky and Rudolph go, like we mentioned the last podcast or the podcast before, these are two guys I think you do need to make a decision on. You can't keep paying Trubisky $10 million um, to be a backup quarterback. You need to free up room for other stuff. And – just to be fair to Mason Rudolph, this guy needs an opportunity to go try to play somewhere. If Pittsburgh's moved on from him, which it seems like they have, then Mason Rudolph's not getting any younger. He's never really got a legit shot in Pittsburgh. Yeah, he backed up some games for Roethlisberger, and he at times would win, and he'd sometimes even lose, that sort of thing. But he's never had an opportunity to be a starting quarterback, Mason Rudolph. And he, yep. it doesn't look like that opportunity is going to happen now either. No, I mean, he he tested the waters. He tested the waters, Rob. I, yeah, I had the impression nobody wanted him. And, and that's what I, I got the same thing. And I, 
So one of two things happens with Rudolph. You cut your ties and he's a free agent. Maybe somebody picks him up. Maybe somebody doesn't. But you can't keep holding on to him because I got a feeling that I don't know what Mason Rudolph makes, but I got a feeling he's making a pretty decent penny too. He's been around there a while. Right. So I can't imagine that he's not making a couple bucks. So to me, the first thing they need to do is they need to sort out that quarterback thing. And if there is a dude later in the third, fourth round that they think um, that they can develop and maybe if Pickett isn't the guy next year, then okay, maybe, maybe you take a flyer on somebody like that. To me, first and foremost, and I know you're going to over the next – whatever, you're going to get tired of me saying this. They have to find a playmaker, a wide receiver. To me, it's the one spot that they are missing. They they need to find a guy that can draw double teams. They need to find a guy that takes some pressure off pickings. They need to get as far away from Deontay Johnson as possible, whether or not they have to change their address, they have to change their phone number, whatever it is. They need uh, to distance themselves from Deontay Johnson. I don't care if they have to come in and move the stadium in the middle of the night and not tell, tell him where it's at. He has to go. And I then they, they need to rebuild. That. They need playmakers on at the, at the, at the wide receiver position. If, if Pickett is going to be your guy, he needs help. Then, yeah, I'm with the offensive line. Um, I think we are missing one or two guys. Um, and then I'm with you. Then secondary is where we need to go next. Uh, I think Porter will eventually turn into a good good guy. Mink is okay. But I, as far as other corners and stuff like that, I think we're a corner of safety. And eventually, Ron, we're going to have to find another guy. I mean, we're running through guys in the middle. Of the, those, that middle linebacker position right now is killing us. We can't find anybody to stay healthy for one game, let alone a half a game, to where we got Blake Martinez on the roster now. And Blake Blake Martinez hasn't been relevant since he was at – I believe he was at Air Force for crying out loud. Right. So um, – Well, fortunately, one good thing, there are linebackers, linemen, and receivers coming out that are pretty deep in the draft. I think we're short. There's going to be a shortage on running backs. Uh, quarterbacks ain't going to start popping. I mean, you'll get your first two out there, but then I don't think you're going to see quarterbacks to the third, fourth round. And no. but but receivers, there is some quality receivers out there in the yeah. draft. So there's a lot of good people that can fall to them. I say if they can load up, like you said, let's dump let's dump all these heavyweight. Big contracts coming up like Deontay Johnson, Najee, Najee Harris. Do you think they're going to pay him what he wants? I don't know. Well, I, I think that I think that market sailed on running backs. I, I don't think these guys I, – I mean, if he comes out and he's going to hold out for big money, then okay, then yeah, let's, let's cut ties. And, I mean, you can always find a running back. I, I like the direction that they're heading with Warren and Harris. And, I, and I've seen – I don't know about you, but the last two games, I've seen a spark out of Harris. I, I like where Najee Harris is right now. I I don't know what, what happened or what's going on, I but I, I like where he's at. I like where Warren's at. I like this combo. And if, if they can continue to keep them together, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But if one of them is going to get selfish and say, hey, no, I want to get paid, well – all right, let's go find another running back. They're all over the place. I mean, you know, from playing fantasy football, guy gets hurt. There's always a dude right behind him ready to step in, and you're going to have 50 guys on the Internet trying to get them on their team the next day. So it's not right. like the, the, this isn't 30 years ago when you had one running back on each team that got the ball 30 times and uh, got to 100 yards and scored two touchdowns. Those days are long gone. Uh, they're So – I I think we're okay at running back with Najee and and Warren, as long as neither one of them gets too big for their britches and decides that they want to be paid more than the other one or vice versa. Right. I, which could happen. I mean, it's human nature. So, hey, I know we're I know we're talking football, but I want to throw this in here. Um, I know you're 
huge baseball guy. I was kind of, I was glad to see Jim uh, Leland, the former Pirates manager, become the 23rd manager uh, elected into Cooperstown. Yeah, uh, couldn't couldn't got a better guy. Leland always a class act. Um, even even at his press conference, they asked him. Uh, I was watching that the other day. They asked him uh, which team he was going to re. He, I think he coached five or six different teams, and they asked him which one he was going to go with, and he. He kind of downplayed the question and said, oh, I'll, I'll talk to the committee about that. And he goes, out of respect for all of them, all those teams that I coached, uh, I can't make that decision right now. And, I mean, as us being pirate fans and stuff like that, it being selfish, you think, oh, you got to be a pirate fan. I mean, that's where everything started, and that's where that's where you want to be. But um, uh, I couldn't be happier for Jim Leland and uh, – Whatever he decides is is going to be good. He's always going to be a pirate manager to me. So that's uh, yeah, well deserved, well deserved for Jim. Yeah, I, I was extremely happy to see that man. I'm telling you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Real quick, I want to go over this real quick. Impressive rookie class, and then uh, we'll close up shop. But uh, I tell you what. This has been an impressive rookie year. I was going down and looking through different stats and numbers. Quarterback, Stroud, I mean, he, he definitely should be rookie of the year, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, running back, Bijan Robinson. Um, Jameer Gibbs. Puka. Man, that first game, he come out looking like Randy Moss, Hall of Fame. Here we go. And, and for the uh, most part, he stayed consistent all year. He's done a good job. It's impressive. Yeah, and Coop's looking. Coop's he's hurting. Yeah, you know, Coop up. I mean, he's um, Tank Dow. I mean, unfortunately, he's out for the year now. But man, up until he got hurt, he was the real deal. Also, yeah. from Houston, uh, Addison. Got to give him credit. I mean, he jumped right in there. Uh, former former pick guy Jordan Addison. Yeah, yeah. I'm all him. He's uh, yeah, I drafted him in every league I could get my hands on this year. He was uh, he was a great late round pick for me in both leagues. Uh, and tight end, man, Laporta. Whoa, yeah, what I was a actually, tight end. I was watching Fantasy Live this morning at uh, five o'clock this morning on NFL Network, and there was a question, and this kind of blew me away. Dude sent like a tweet question into the show, and he asked, "Would you start Laporta over Kelsey?" And two of the three guys basically said, "Well, yeah, depending yeah. on the matchup, Laporta is that good." So, I mean, for Laporta to be in that conversation, that you would even remotely start him over Kelsey. And what kind of league are you in that you have Laporta and Kelsey in the same freaking lineup? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you and your dog? Would you out? Would you out draft your dog that day in the lineup that you got both Laporta and Kelsey? And why are you making that decision? Why is it one your flex leg and one your starting tight end? You moron! Holy I know. cow! <laughs> I know. Yeah, and then on defense, there's one guy that Hutchinson. He actually he has he has foot footed the bill uh, for oh, Detroit. Yeah. Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan. Hell yeah. He's a tough dude. Yep. I mean, yeah, every, no. every time. Hey, I want to give a shout out. We, uh, we've had a lot of fans. They, they email me. I want to shout out to uh, Steve Johns, uh, Terry Olay, Bart LeVere, El Certeza. These people, they've continuously give back support. And we appreciate it, guys. Thank yeah, you very much. Fun. Uh, I like to, we're talking about having uh, some more guests on. We can have a guest on here as well, but um, definitely with the cross face wrestling. But we're going to close it up. And uh, what do you think about tonight? Um, I think I think the oh, boy. I hate to say this, but I, I do think the Steelers will win tonight, um, probably in a close game. But I, I think there's going to be a sense of urgency tonight, and. Um, it's actually, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of anticipating Trubisky come out and having a game. I, I, I really, I think there's a dude right now 
that you can almost say is maybe auditioning for a job next year. And True. I, I think you could see him come out and maybe put some numbers up. I'm not I'm not saying 350 and three, but if he can come out and throw for a couple hundred and maybe two, I think it's a success. So I, I'm gonna say that I think I'm gonna say Pittsburgh wins. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy. I think that New England does play good enough defense that they're going to give them some problems. But I think Pittsburgh comes out of this with a win at home. On, and we know how Pittsburgh does on Thursday nights and Monday nights and Sunday nights. They very, they don't lose very often on primetime games, so um, especially at home. So I, I do think Pittsburgh wins tonight. All right. All right. And with that, I want to thank, I want to thank you, Rob. I want to thank everybody uh, watching, supporting. We appreciate it. Please subscribe, like, comment. I uh, appreciate the comments, the messages. Um, we love your support. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Ronnie.